Okay, um, before I go on to depreciation, I did want it, you to take a look on page 232. Now I know like in your book, they go and they do pages and pages and pages of exchanges of non-monetary assets. Okay, and first of all, I want to warn you, okay, this handout, okay, this handout is for the CPA exam, okay? Do not take this handout to work and try to do non-monetary exchange <laughs> transactions and work doing this. For that, you will consult Kiso and Wiggins Intermediate Accounting, okay? So don't do that, okay? This is just a quick and dirty little thing to help you on the CPA exam, all right? Please, all right? Also, this will not work for regulation, okay? So when Phil does exchanges, of non-monetary assets, I think they're called Section 1031 exchanges. They um, uh, exchange uh, uh, real property for real property and personal property for personal property in Section 1031 exchanges for regulation. Don't use this handout for regulation, okay? It's only for this section, only for financial accounting, only for non-monetary transactions um, exchanges on the CPA exam. All right, now they go through pages and pages and pages of this stuff beginning on uh, page 228, then page 229, then page 230, and then page 231, and then for most of page 232, they just go, yeah, 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 about the non-monetary exchanges, yeah. I do all that on a handout for you, <laughs> okay? So just skip that stuff, um, just read my handout. Now on page 232, there is a couple of things that I want to point out to you on this. On page 232, about two-thirds of the way down the page, they have letter D, which is a purchase of groups of fixed assets, which is a basket purchase. Remember that when you buy something, typically you'll say, oh, we'll, we'll pay like $10 million for this piece of property. And the $10 million will include the building, all the furniture in the building, all the fixtures in the building, okay? Any vehicles that accompany the building, like snow blowers, like lawn mowers, okay, riding lawn mowers, that type of equipment, that type of thing. Okay, also uh, along with the building will be the parking lot. Okay, um, and then there'll be sidewalks, all right, and then there'll be, you know, lamp fixtures and what have you, outdoor lamp, outdoor lighting and what have you, landscaping, whatever. Okay, all those things are all separate items. You're going to have to take the $10 million purchase price, you're going to have to allocate it to the land, the building, the furniture, the fixtures, the equipment, okay, the vehicles. The land improvement, the parking lot, all that's got to be split up. How do you do it? Based on their relative fair market values. That's what they're talking about here in the relative fair market values. So you have to split it up based on its relative fair market values. So just take a look at the example, read over the example at the bottom page 232. Now, at the bottom page 232, also letter E, letter E, capital versus revenue expenditures. Okay, now that you have this asset, you're going to spend more money on it. Okay, when you spend more money on it, do you capitalize that cost or do you expense that cost? Well, the answer, of course, is it depends. Capital versus revenue expenditures at the bottom, page 232. Capital expenditures and revenue expenditures are charges that are incurred after the acquisition cost has been determined and the related fixed asset is already in operation. Turn to the top of page 233. Capital expenditures are not normal recurring expenses. They benefit the operations of more than one period. The cost of major rearrangements of assets to increase efficiency is an example of a capital expenditure. Then they have revenue expenditures. Revenue expenditures are normal recurring expenditures. However, some expenditures that meet the test for capital expenditures are expensed because they are immaterial. Expenditures that improve the efficiency or extend the life should be capitalized and charged to future periods. Um, a subtle distinction is made between an improvement in efficiency and extension of the useful life. Some of the accountants feel improvements in efficiency should be charged to the asset and that improvements extending the life should be charged to accumulated depreciation. The rationale is that improvements extending the asset life will need to be depreciated over an extended period of time. Then they say blah, blah, blah about the following chart. Forget looking at the chart, okay? Let me tell you what they're trying to say here. You just have to have a familiarity with all their terminology, okay? And these are the terminology. All right, for costs incurred on the asset after you put the asset into use. Terminology is as follows. You can have revenue expenditures, and then you can have versus capital expenditures. Okay, first of all, the revenue expenditures are typically considered to be repair and maintenance expense. Repair and maintenance expense. 
All the repair and maintenance suspense does is to um, keep the uh, asset in its normal operating condition. So it's keep the asset in its normal operating condition. Okay. Now, where do you report repair and maintenance expense for these expenditures that just keep the asset in its normal operating condition? Examples would be, you might patch a hole in the roof. That will keep the asset in its normal operating condition. You might paint your building. Now, don't be confused by the total cost of it. If you spent a million dollars to paint the building, you might say, well, wow, a million dollars, that's a lot of money. Well, it could be a really big building. I mean, you could, pa you could be painting the Mall of America. That would cost definitely a million dollars to paint that. Okay, the Mall of America, biggest mall. Yeah, it's in Minnesota. I went to go visit that mall. Anyway, where do you report the repair and maintenance expense? Well, the answer is it depends. It depends on what you're using the asset for. If it's repair and maintenance expense on a factory machine, the repair and maintenance expense is part of factory overhead, then it eventually ends up in work in progress, finished goods inventory, and eventually in cost of goods sold. If the repair and maintenance expense is on, um, for example, the Learjet that drives around, that flies around all the executives, okay, then the uh, repair and maintenance expense on the Learjet would be considered to be a general administrative expense. What if it's repair and maintenance expense on all the delivery trucks? If it's repair and maintenance expense on the delivery trucks, the delivery trucks deliver the goods to our customers, so that would be a selling expense. What if it's repair and maintenance expense on the laboratory building where we conduct, conduct all our research and development? In that case, repair and maintenance expense would be considered to be an R&D expense. Okay? So it depends then, where do you show the repair and maintenance expense? It depends on what you're repairing and maintaining. And it always goes to that character of that asset. Now. Remember that revenue expenditures just keep the asset in its normal operating condition. Now, for the capital expenditures, the capital expenditures are divided into three types. They are additions, betterments, and extraordinary repairs. Once again, the capital expenditures are considered to be additions, betterments, and extraordinary repairs. All right, we all understand what is an addition. When you have an addition to a building, you just add on to the building. You're just going to be debiting the building and crediting cash. Okay, that's the journal entry. Now, there is a, uh, um, a distinction that's made between betterments and extraordinary repairs. If something is a betterment, a betterment increases productivity, efficiency, but it does not, does not extend the useful life. If you have a betterment, it just makes it better. It will increase its productivity. It will increase its efficiency. But it does not extend the useful life. The journal entry for a betterment would be to just debit the asset and credit cash. Debit the asset and credit cash. That's a journal entry for a betterment. Most types of rearrangements, if you do rearrangements of um, the, the product line, um, those are examples of betterments, okay? Those are major rearrangements of your production line. That's considered an example of a betterment. Now, what about an extraordinary repair? What's unique about the extraordinary repair is it extends the useful life. Extends the useful life. Now, the journal entry for an extraordinary repair does look a little bit weird because what it does is it debits accumulated depreciation and it credits cash. Okay. So with a betterment, you debit cash, you, excuse me, you debit the asset, you credit cash. But with an extraordinary repair, you debit accumulated depreciation, you credit cash. The thing is, is this. Here you have the way the asset would appear on the balance sheet. The historical costs minus accumulated depreciation will give you the carrying value or book value of the asset. If you have an extraordinary repair, by debiting the accumulated depreciation, you debit the accumulated depreciation, and what that will do is decrease the accumulated depreciation. Accumulated depreciation has a normal balance of credit. By debiting it, what you'll do is you'll decrease it. So you decrease the accumulated depreciation in extraordinary repair, and that increases the carrying value. In a betterment, what you're doing is you're debiting the asset and crediting cash. By debiting the asset, you increase the historical costs. When you increase the historical cost, then the carrying value increases. No matter what, and this is for a betterment, no matter what, 
They both increase the carrying value of the asset. That's why they're called capital expenditures. And of course, in addition, we all understand addition. You just add a wing to a building. Okay. Let's take a look at a couple of multiple choice questions on this. Multiple choice questions number 21 and 22, please. Number 21 and 22. 21 and 22 are found on pages 244 and 245. Number 21, which starts on page 244 and hangs over to page 245. Uh, number 21 says, how much should be recharged to repair and maintenance expense in 2008? Remember that a repair and maintenance expense is part of revenue expenditures. Revenue expenditure is repair and maintenance expense. It just keeps the asset in its normal operating condition. How much should be charged to repair and maintenance expense in 2008? 21 says, during 2008, the King Company made the following expenditures related to its plant building. Continuing and frequent repairs, 40000 Yep, that sounds like a, a repair and maintenance expense. How about painting? We painted the plant building. Yep, that sounds like... Uh, repair and maintenance expense. How about major improvements to the electrical wiring system? Okay, folks, major improvements to the electrical wiring system to me sounds like a betterment. It improves the productivity, it improves the efficiency, but it does not extend the useful life. So to me, that's a betterment. So that is not treated as repair and maintenance expense. How about partial replacement of the roof tiles? So we just maybe patched a few roof tiles. We didn't replace the whole roof, we just patched some tiles. So to me, that sounds like a repair and maintenance expense. If they say how much should be charged to repair and maintenance expense, I think it would be the 40, the 10, and the 14. The 40, the 10, and the 14 is a total of 64,000. So the correct answer for number 21 is C. Okay, it's C. Let's take a look at another one, number 22. Number 22 says, the overhaul resulted in significant increase in production. Neither the attachment nor the overhaul increased the estimated useful life of the press. What amount of the above cost should be capitalized? So they want to know what should be capitalized. I'm looking at number 22 on page 245. On June 18th of 2008, the Dell Printing Company incurred the following costs for one of its printing presses. Now remember, all of this did a significant increase to production, but it did not increase the useful life of the asset. So what do you think it's probably going to be? It's probably all going to be a what? A betterment, right, because they increased production. On June 18th, 2008, Dell Printing Company incurred the following costs for one of its printing presses. Purchase of collating and stapling attachment, 84000 Yeah, I think you would capitalize that. How about installation of the attachment? Yep, you ca capitalize all the costs that you incur in order to put the asset into use. How about replacement parts for overhauling it? Yes, all right, you would capitalize that. And then labor and overhead in connection with the overhaul, 14000 The overhaul resulted in a significant increase in production, Neither the attachment nor the overhaul increased the estimated useful life. So they're saying all of these things are betterments. What amount of the above cost should be capitalized? I would say you would capitalize all of it. So it's the 84 plus the 36 plus the 26 plus the 14. It's a total of 160,000. So the correct answer there would be D, like David. You see they're trying to trick you. They're saying to you, the reason they're trying to trick you is they're saying that it didn't increase production. Okay, excuse me, it didn't increase the useful life. They're trying to trick you and say, well, if you don't increase the useful life, then you don't capitalize it. That's not true. If you increase the useful life, that's called extraordinary repair. That's one journal entry, but it's still capital expenditure. Then you have a betterment, even if you don't increase all right, the useful life. If you make it more productive, more efficient, then it's considered to be a betterment. It's still a capital expenditure. You debit the asset, you credit the cash. Either way, whether you call something an extraordinary repair or betterment, you will increase the carrying value of the asset. You will increase the carrying value of the asset. So the best answer then is you capitalize them all, and the best answer for that for number 22 is D, like David. Okay. Now we're probably going to talk about depreciation. Yippee, yippee, yippee. Let's take a look on page 233, please. On page 233, about one-third of the way down on page 233, they talk about depreciation. So let's read a little bit about this. Letter F says, depreciation is an annual charge to income for the asset use during the period. Since depreciation is a non-cash expense, it does not provide resources for replacement of the asset. It's simply a means of spreading asset costs to periods in which the asset produced revenue. Yes, we recognize revenue, uh, excuse me, we recognize depreciation expense to match it against the revenue in compliance with the matching principle because the assets, we consume the assets in order to generate revenue. So we have to match the usage of the assets called depreciation against the revenues that that um, machine helps to generate those revenues. Essentially, the depreciable basis or the depreciation base is allocated over the life 
uh, in a rational and systematic manner. The depreciable base is the maximum amount of depreciation you can take over the life of the asset. The depreciable base is the maximum amount of uh, depreciation you can take over the life of the asset. It is the historical cost minus the salvage value. Okay. Also, on the exam, they like to use the words terminal value and residual value. Terminal value, residual value, salvage value all mean the same thing. And you take the cost minus the salvage value, and that gives you the depreciable basis or the maximum amount of depreciation you can take over the life of the asset. Um, they have three little words that they always use for depreciation is that it's got to be systematic, rational, and it's just an allocation. Now drop down to the bottom page 233. They have um, the different methods. And the different methods they have are they have the straight line method. Um, the straight line method is always based on time. Then they have accelerated method, also not known as um, decreasing charge methods, where you take more depreciation towards the beginning and less depreciation towards the end of the life of the asset. The two most often tested uh, methods for accelerated depreciation are the de double declining balance, um, also known as part of the declining balance, and then some of the year's digits. And I'll be showing you all of those different kinds of methods. Um, don't forget uh, some graphs. If you look on page, you can skip that chart on page 234. But if you go on page 235, they have some nice little graphs there. Okay, for the graphs, they have um, straight line depreciation, just look like that. I'm at the top of page 235, straight lines, graph looks straight line. Some of the years digits goes down in a straight line. W, uh, declining balance kind of like look like that. Um, it's uh, what they call a, um, a um, asymptote, meaning it doesn't quite touch the zero. Um, they say that the accelerated depreciation right underneath the graphs on page 235, the accelerated depreciation is justified because you want to, you have increased productivity when the asset's new, you have increasing maintenance charges with age, and then there's a risk of obsolescence. Then finally, they have something called group or composite depreciation, um, two-thirds of the way down on page 235. Composite or group depreciation averages the service life of a number of property units and depreciates the group as if it were a single unit. The term group is used when the assets are similar. They usually use the word homogeneous and then composite when they are dissimilar. Okay, once again, you have group de depreciation. The assets are homogeneous, meaning the assets are extremely similar. Then you have composite depreciation. This is heterogeneous. Heterogeneous, okay? So here the assets are very similar. And here the assets are different. Okay, that's why they're called heterogeneous. Okay, now. The concept is just the same. The only difference is, are the assets really similar or just kind of similar? They're really, really similar. It's called group depreciation. Basically, you just throw everything into a giant pool. You say the average life is, what, 10 years? You take one-tenth of the historical cost. That's your depreciation expense. Call it a day. <laughs> then you have composite depreciation. Let's just say you have um, everything with wheels gets thrown into that group. Everything with wheels, like so trucks tractor trailers, forklifts, all right? They all get thrown into that. They're all similar, they all have wheels. Okay, everything that has wheels, but it doesn't fly, okay? When it flies, all right, then it's an airplane, then it goes into a completely different group. All right, so they have composite depreciation, that would be a heterogeneous group, everything with wheels, trucks, tractor trailers, forklifts. And they'll say, oh, the average life of all these assets together is like 12 years. Then you just take a look at the historical cost, take one twelfth of that, that's your depreciation expense. So it's group and composite depreciation. What's unique about group and composite depreciation is at the top of page 236, at the top of page 236, uh, what I want you to notice is that when you have group or composite depreciation, um, right at the bottom, page 235, at the very, very top of page 236, at the very bottom, page 235, there's the last couple of sentences there. At the bottom, page 235, it says, also note, I'm at the very bottom of page 235, the last two sentences. Also note that gains and losses are not recognized on disposal, that gains and losses are netted in the accumulated depreciation. All right, so the entry to record a retirement is, turn the page to page 236, in group or composite depreciation, you do not record a gain or loss on the disposal of the asset. That's what's unique about it. You're going to credit the asset at its historical cost. 
you're going to debit the cash for whatever you received for cash when you dispose of the old asset. And then the plug goes to accumulated depreciation. So no gain or loss is ever recognized on group or composite depreciation unless you get rid of every single asset in the group or every single asset in the composite pool. And how likely is that going to be? Not very likely because you need your assets in order to generate revenues. So no gain or loss is recognized in that. Okay, um, what I want to do is I want to just show you um, a couple of multiple choice uh, questions on depreciation. Before I do that, let me just show you group or composite depreciation really quick. Let's just say here's my historical cost minus my accumulated depreciation. That gives me my carrying value. Let's just say this is before a disposal and this is after a disposal and this is for group or composite depreciation. Before and after. Let's just say this is 10 minus 3, this is 7. Okay. Um, let's just dispose um, of a piece of equipment that had a historical cost of 2. All right. So we're going to debit cash for 1. Okay. Uh, that's how much cash that we receive. We credit the old asset for two, okay, and then because there's no gain or loss recorded on the um, disposal of a piece of equipment accounted for under group or composite depreciation, the plug will be to accumulated depreciation, and I'll plug it for one. So one and one equals two. Really simple math here. So what happens is after the disposal, my historical cost drops by two, so now that is eight, and the accumulated depreciation dropped by one, so this is now two. So this is now 8 minus 2 is a difference of 6. So what is that difference? This 1 is the amount of the cash. This $1 difference is the amount of the cash proceeds. So remember that the carrying value will decrease by the amount of the cash proceeds. Okay. Also, if you take a look, once again, at the top of page 235, these graphs are very nice because they do like to test graphs. On the CPA exam, occasionally you might see a graph. Okay. Not too many graphs, only because graphs take up a lot of space. Whenever they do a problem with a graph in it, it is done as a picture or a JPEG embedded into the um, multiple choice question. Um, but occasionally, especially for depreciation, you might see these graphs. Remember, it's straight line, then you have sum of the year's digits, then you have double declining balance. What is good about the accelerated depreciation is that accelerated depreciation means the depreciation expense is higher, which means the carrying value of the asset is much lower. Okay? then it's lower sooner. So then it is more conservative if you use an accelerated method of depreciation. Another thing about um, accelerated depreciation is that accelerated depreciation does do better matching. It's more of compliance with the matching principle. The reason is because if you have a brand new asset that makes lots of revenues, to that you want to match lots of expenses. So when you match revenues that are higher, a brand new machine with lot, makes lots and lots of revenues, it makes lots and lots of widgets for you, then what happens is you match lots more expenses. That is better in compliance with the matching principle. As the machine gets older, um, it generates you know, widgets that are in less demand and you know, has a tendency to break down, so it generates fewer and fewer revenues for you, this machine, to that you want to make, match less depreciation expense to it, so that would be the accelerated pattern of depreciation. So it does better matching if it's accelerated depreciation, and it also is more conservative, because remember, the, the higher your depreciation expense, um, the lower your carrying value, and it gets to a lower carrying value even faster. All right, let's just see if we could take a look at some multiple choice questions on depreciation. I will demonstrate a problem for you that um, does a whole bunch of different depreciation methods. I'll do that one, but I'll probably do that one last. And of course, I'm just dropping everything now. <laughs> That's what Cindy always does. I drop things. Those of you who've been watching, now what happened to my pen? You know, could I have a pen, please? I don't. I'm just a disaster today. <laughs> I need a pen. Here, here's my help. Oh, thank you. I caught it. <laughs> Don't expect that to repeat. <laughs> okay, let's just take a look and see if we could do some multiple choice questions on this. All right, now let me show you an example of a multiple choice question that looks like a computational question, but it's really a theory question. Let's take a look at multiple choice question number 30. Number 30 is found at the bottom page 244 and kind of hangs over to page 246. Let me tell you, I'm going to show you some ones. This one is a doozy, okay? This one is a doozy. It says um, on uh, 
Let's take a look there on uh, multiple choice number 30 on pages 245 to 246. The stem on page 246 from multiple choice 30 says, if the equipment's disposition resulted in a reported loss, which of the following depreciation methods did Crater use? Number 30 says, on January 1st of 2004, the Crater Company purchased equipment having an estimated salvage value equal to 20% of its, historic, of its original cost at the end of the 10-year life. The equipment was sold December 31st, 2008 for 50% of its original cost. If the equipment's disposi disposition resulted in reported loss, which of the following depreciation methods did Crater use? Okay. Well, first of all, do not try and say, all right, let's try and fit some numbers into this problem. Do not do that with this problem, okay? It'll be just too hard. This is really a theory problem. It is not a computational problem. First of all, we can eliminate answer D like David. The reason we can eliminate answer D like David is I already told you, in group or composite depreciation, there is no gain or loss recognized in disposal. You'll credit the old asset and the historical cost, debit cash, and the accumulated depreciation will just be a plug. There's never any gain or loss recognized on a disposal under group or composite depreciation. The only time you'd ever recognize gain or loss on disposal under group or composite depreciation if you got rid of every single asset in that group pool or composite pool. And that's just not going to happen. So we know it cannot be answer D for number 30. Now if you look at answer A and answer B, both answer A and answer B are accelerated methods. So if you have accelerated methods, that means the depreciation expense is much higher, which means the carrying value is lower. Well, if the carrying value is lower, you're not really likely to incur a loss on disposal. So if they said, if the equipment's disposition resulted in a reported loss, which of the following depreciation methods the crater used? The reason that they incurred a loss on disposal of the equipment is because the cash they got was not enough to, to cover the carrying value, which means the carrying value was really high and the cash was really low, and that's how they incurred the cost. Well, what would be the depreciation method which would lead to a higher carrying value? Which method would it be? Not an accelerated method like some of the year's digits or double declining. So the best answer there would be answer C, the straight line method. The straight line method will lead to a higher carrying value where it's, le where it's more likely that you would incur a loss on disposal. So the best answer for number 30 is answer C. Okay, let's take a look at multiple choice number 37. Number 37 said, <clears throat> um, number 37 says, a, um, the net carrying amount of the composite asset accounts would be decreased by what? Number 37 on page 246 says, a company which is using the composite depreciation method for its fleet of trucks, cars, and campers, retired one of its trucks, and they received cash from the salvage company. The net carrying amount of the composite asset accounts would be decreased by what? Okay, we already sa said that whenever you have a disposal under group or composite depreciation, under group or composite depreciation of disposal, you do not record a gain or a loss on disposal unless you dispose of every single item in that pool, which they didn't do in this case. So in my little goofy example here, I credited the old asset as historical cost. I debited cash, so I credited that for two. I made up all these numbers. I debited cash for one, and I plugged the accumulated depreciation. So what happens before the disposal at a carrying value of seven and after the disposal at a carrying value of six, and that difference was for the amount of the cash, okay? It decreased by the amount of the cash. So when they ask you in number 37, the net carrying amount of the composite asset accounts would be decreased by, it would be decreased by, the amount would be one, which would be answer B, like Barbara, the amount of cash proceeds received. So the best answer for number 37 would be B, like Barbara. The not, for 37 would be B, like Barbara. Okay, let's see if we can take a look at um, an oldie but goodie. We're going to take a look at multiple choice number 27. We're going to demonstrate all the different methods of depreciation, okay? On, um, on, uh, on page 245, multiple choice number 27. This is going to require a lot of board work. We're going to demonstrate each one of the depreciation methods. Okay, in number 27, which is found on page 245, they say, using the same depreciation method that was used in 2006, 2007, and 2008, 
How much depreciation expense should Rago record in 2009 for the asset? Okay, 27 says, the Rago company takes a full year's depreciation expense in the year of the asset's acquisition and no depreciation expense in the year of disposition. Data relating to one of Rago's depreciable assets at December 31st, 2008 are as follows. The acquisition year is 2006, okay. The cost is 110000 The residual value, also known as salvage value, the terminal value is 20000 The accumulated depreciation as of December 31st, 2008 is 72000 And the estimated useful life is five years. Using the same method that was used in 2006, 2007, and 2008, how much depreciation expense w should Rago record in 2009 for this asset? Okay, so basically what they're saying is they have this accumulated depreciation account. And they purchased the asset in 2006. So they've recorded depreciation expense for 06, 07, and 08. And they're saying that the total as of December 31st, 2008, that balance is 72000 And we have to figure out what method they used in 2006, 2007, 2008, add it up for 2009 and get a revised balance. Okay, and we'll get the revised balance here. Okay, so let's see what they want. Rago takes a full year's depreciation expense the year of the assets acquisition and no depreciation expense in the year of disposition. Data relating to the depreciable assets are as follows. Okay, first let's try the straight line method. Now, of course, folks, the straight line method is the easiest method that there is, so of course it's not going to be the answer. <laughs> But let's just try the straight line method anyway. All right, in the straight line method, straight line depreciation method, what you're going to do is you're going to take the historical cost minus the salvage value, and you're going to divide by the, that by the life, okay? The historical cost is 110000 The salvage value is 20000 The useful life is what they say the life was, oh, yeah, five years. Five years. So... That will be 90,000 divided by five years. That's going to be $18,000 per year, right? Isn't that right? 90 divided by five. Yeah, it's 18. So that means this would be 18,000, 18,000, 18,000. So I take 18, 18, and 18. That would be the straight line method. Does that equal 72,000? No, it's only 54,000. Guess what? Straight line is not the answer. What a surprise. <laughs> okay, the next method then would be the double declining balance of method. So let's see what that method will look like. Now, in the declining balance method, what you're going to do is you're going to take one over the life okay, which is 1 over 5. You're then going to convert this to a percentage. So that becomes 20%. This is called the declining balance percentage. Now the declining balance percentage, then you can double that times 2, which will be 40%. And this is called double the declining balance percentage. But you don't necessarily have to double it. You could multiply that by 150% in which case that would be 30%. You could multiply it by 3, in which case it would be treble declining balance. I've even seen them multiply it by 250%. Okay, 250%, I can't even do that math anymore. 20 times 2.5. Okay, 50%. All of these are considered to be valid forms of declining balance percentage. But the most often tested one on the exam is double the declining balance percentage. Double the declining balance. But remember, you can take this declining balance percentage, which is really just one over the life, but they convert it to a percentage, and you multiply it by 150% or 3 or 250%, whatever. But the most common one is double, see, times 2, double the declining balance percentage. Okay, so let's try that one. 2006, 2007, 2008, okay. The thing is, is this. You'll take the 40% and you'll multiply that by the historical cost, not minus the salvage, minus accumulated depreciation. 
That's the formula. It's a historical cost minus the accumulated depreciation. Now the historical cost is 110,000. The accumulated depreciation in the first year is zero. So 40% times 110,000 is going to be 44,000. So let's see in this method. Let's put the 44,000 here. Then in 2007, you're going to take 40% times 110,000 minus the 44,000. So 110 minus the 44 is going to give you 66,000. Then 66,000 times 40% is 26,400. 26,400 for 2007. Then for 2008, you're going to take 40% times 110,000 minus, okay, what's the balance in accumulated depreciation now? For here and here, it would be 44 plus a 26, 4, 70,400 is now the balance for these two years. So 110,000 minus 70,400. So 110,000 minus the 70,400 is 39,600. Then you take the 39,600 and multiply that by the 40%. That's going to give you 15,840. So I would put the 15,840 here. So then I'll say, well, when I take the 44,000 from 2006, the 26,400 from 2007, the 15,840 from 2008, does that equal 72,000? 44,000 plus 26,400 plus 15,840. Nope, it equals 86,240. That's not it. Okay, so which method is it then? It's going to be the last accelerated method, which is going to be some of the year's digits. Now remember, for a declining balance, double the declining balance is the most often tested one on the exam. Okay, so what does that mean? Some of the year's digits next. Remember this, when you take the declining balance percentage of the 40% that was double the declining balance, you're going to multiply that by the historical cost minus the accumulated depreciation. But you can never depreciate below the salvage value. So the total amount in here, all right, can never be more than 90,000. The reason the total amount here can never be more than 90,000 is 90,000 is the depreciable basis, meaning that the maximum amount of depreciation they can take over the life of the asset is the historical cost minus the salvage value. So you can never depreciate below the salvage value of the 20,000. Now let's take a look at the sum of the year's digits method. Okay, sum of the year's digits method. In the sum of the year's digits method, you just take the life and you go 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. Okay. 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. Now that will equal 15, and that will work unless you have like a useful life of like 12 years. Then you'll be 12 plus 11 plus 10 plus 8. Oh, skip number 9, start all over again. So memorize this cute little formula here. It's really n times n plus 1 divided by 2 where n is the useful life, and it works really well in case you have to add up like some weird number like 12 years or 13 years or 15 years, which, you know, by the exam, they, on the exam, they could do that. So n, which is a useful life, in our case, the useful life is 5 years, so 5 times 5 plus 1 divided by 2. So this is 5 times 6, which is 30, divided by 2. That gives you the same thing, which is the 15 here. Okay. Let's just go ahead and erase this and see if we can figure this out. So, for 2006, 2007, and 2008, now that you came up with a 15, that goes in the denominator. And you just start counting out backwards from the life. Five years life, four years life, three years life. Then you multiply this by the historical cost minus the salvage value again. Okay, where the historical cost is 110,000 minus the salvage value, which is 20,000. Remember, in double the declining balance, you multiply the historical cost minus the accumulated depreciation. That's very important. And this is the same, so that's 90,000. That 90,000 is the same for all three years. Okay, so always you multiply this ratio times the historical cost minus the salvage value. 
salvage value. So that's 90,000 times 5 fifteenths. So that's one fifth, uh, one third, one third of the 90,000 is 30,000. So we'll put that there. 30,000. And then we have 4 fifteenths. 4 divided by 15, multiply that by the 90,000. That's going to give me 24,000. And then 3 fifteenths, which is 1 fifth times the 90,000, is going to give me 18,000. So it's 5 fifteenths times 90, 4 fifteenths times 90, 3 fifteenths times 90. So you have the 24,000 and then the 18,000. So when I take then the 30 plus the 24 plus the 18, does that give me the 72? Yes, we found it finally. So let's calculate the depreciation for 2009. That would be 2 fifteenths times the historical cost minus the salvage value of 90. So 2 divided by 15 times the 90,000 is going to give me $12,000. So the depreciation for 2009 would be 12,000 and the ending balance here would be 84,000. Now, let's answer the question. Number 27 says using the same depreciation method as used in 2006, 2007 and 2008, how much depreciation expense should Rago record in 2009 for this asset? The answer is $12,000. But they could really ask you three questions. And the three important questions are, number one, what is the amount of depreciation expense that they would recognize in 2009? The amount of depreciation expense they would recognize in 2009 is 12000 Number two, what is the ending balance in accumulated depreciation? The ending balance in accumulated depreciation as of December 31st, 2009 is $84,000. Number three, what is the carrying value of the asset? The carrying value of the asset is the historical cost of $110,000 minus the ending balance and accumulated depreciation, which is $84,000, gives me the carrying value, which would be $26,000. Isn't that right? Let me see. Let me check my math. $110 minus $84,000. I, I cannot do any math in my head. I'm terrible at math, which sounds so weird for an accountant. But that's okay, because accountants do not have to know math. We have to know rules. That is what financial accounting is about. Financial accounting is not about math, because the math never gets more complicated than add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Accounting is about memorizing the rules. Financial accounting is GAP, which is about the rules. OK, so the carrying value is 26000 So remember, what are the three important questions? Number one, what is the depreciation expense for any period? Number two, what is the ending balance for accumulated depreciation for any period? Number three, what is the carrying value of the asset? for any period, okay? They could ask you any method for any period. And be careful. In this case, you took a full year's depreciation in the year of acquisition because you're taking no depreciation in the year of disposition. That may not be necessarily true for another problem. In another problem, they could purchase the asset on July 1st, in which case if they purchase, purchase the asset on July 1st, you're going to have to prorate everything. Okay? Make sure you always look to see if you have to prorate the depreciation. Be careful about prorating the depreciation. Okay? Now, not every asset gets purchased on January 1st, so make sure you look at that. Now, where would the depreciation ex expense of $12,000 be reported on the multiple step income statement? The answer is, it depends. If this asset was being used in the factory and the asset was making widgets in the factory, the $12,000 depreciation expense would be part of factory overhead, which goes to work in process, finished goods inventory, and eventually ends up in cost of goods sold. If the depreciation expense is on an atom smasher, that they, I, don't, I have no idea what an atom smasher is, but it sounds like something you use for research and development. Okay, So the atom smasher is used in all the research and development projects by the scientists. Then the depreciation expense on the atom smasher would be part of research and development expense. If $12,000 was on the giant photocopying machine that they used to photocopy all the annual reports to send to the shareholders, in that case, that $12,000 would be part of general and administrative expense on the multiple step income statement. What if this $12,000 was on the fancy brand new showroom where they make all their sales. If the $12,000 on the fancy brand new showroom, you make all your sales in your showroom, so that would be a selling expense, and the $12,000 depreciation expense would be shown as a selling expense in the multiple step income statement. So it depends on what you're using the asset for, where you would report the depreciation expense on the multiple step income statement. Okay. Um, what I want to do then next is I want to talk to you a little bit about impairments. 
Okay? What we're going to do next is we're going to turn to page 236. And on page, and okay, folks, and this is new, there are some multiple choice questions that, not impairments, but standard number 157 that showed up, so I'm going to show you those too. Impairments has been around for a while, but it is impacted by standard number 157 because impairments relies on fair market value and the way you measure fair market values under standard number 157, the brand new troublesome standard. All right, turn to page 236. I just want to point out to you on page 236 about one inch down from the page where it says changes in depreciation. Under standard number 154, I'm on page 236, one inch down the page, in bold print it says changes in depreciation on page 236. We already talked about this in changes in accounting estimate in module 7C. It says per standard number 154, a change in depreciation method is a change in accounting estimate. All right, because it's a change in accounting estimate, it's given prospective treatment. Okay. Also, if you change account, your accounting estimates by number one, um, the uh, number of periods, okay, or you also change the salvage value, remember that's still a change in accounting estimate when you change your number of periods, all right, your useful life, or you change your salvage values, changes in accounting estimates, that's given prospective treatment. We already talked about that in Module 7C when I did accounting changes. One other thing I'm just going to remind you for fractional depreciation, remember that. You have to be very, very careful if you do not purchase the asset on the first year, uh, excuse me, on the first day of that year that you purchase it. If you don't purchase it on the first day, remember you're going to have to prorate the depreciation, okay? So what would happen if I said that I purchased this asset in the middle of the year? If I purchased in the middle of the year of 2006 and it was silent as to how I should do the prorating, you'll have to prorate it. That means in 2006, you would take 15,000 of depreciation, and then in 2007 you'd take 15,000 plus 12,000. And so you'd be always half and half if you purchase the asset on July 1st. So please remember you must prorate. Now we're going to talk a little bit about um, impairments. I do have a very nice little handout for you, impairments. I did update this one um, for standard number 157. So please turn to page 7 of your financial accounting handout. And on page 7 of your financial accounting handout, we're now going to talk about impairments. So we've already talked about purchasing the asset and what do you capitalize as historical cost. Then we talk about spending more on the asset and what do you treat as a revenue expenditure, which is repair and maintenance expense, versus a capital expenditure, which is either an addition or it increases the productivity and efficiency, which is a betterment, or extends a useful life, which is an extraordinary repair. Then we talked about depreciation. What else do you do with the asset? Well, you can also impair it. This is all going through the life cycle of the asset. You can impair the asset. So let's take a look at the um, handout on page 7. Page 7, your financial accounting and reporting handout. Now on page 7, it says at the top, FARE 9, fixed assets, impairment of tangible assets, impairment of intangible assets, and impairment of goodwill. It's the same little handout I have here. Now, every accounting period, you're going to review your assets for impairment. So what are some clues maybe that your assets are impaired? Look at the top of the handout on the far left-hand column. Far, top of the handout, far left-hand side, it says circumstances that may indicate that an impairment has occurred to your assets. First bullet, there's a decline in demand or inability to keep up with technology or competition. Oh, very sad. Nobody wants these widgets anymore. You can't keep up with your... Uh, keep up with technology or competition. Hmm, in current events, that might be the auto industry. Let's continue. <laughs> Net operating loss. You're losing money. Third one, decline in fair market value of the asset. Fourth one, negative cash flows. Okay, you're not generating any cash flows. They are negative. Last one, a change in regulatory or legal environment. And folks, let me tell you, this is never a good thing. It's a bad thing. Okay, like they're saying, the product you're manufacturing is illegal. Stop manufacturing it. Can they do that? Sure. There's plenty of drugs. Okay, there's drugs. Pharmaceuticals. <laughs> I say drugs. There's plenty of pharmaceutical products that um, companies make, and then later on they find that it causes cancer or whatever, and they say cease and desist. The FDA says you can no longer sell that. Okay. And uh, your entire factory that's dedicated to making that, you know, you can change over from making one product to another product, but, uh, you know, that takes time and money. Okay, so then the factory becomes impaired because you can no longer use that factory to make that uh, product anymore. So it's never a good change, it's a bad change. Any one of those indicators or circumstances may be, hey, get a clue, your asset is impaired. Now when we have our tangible assets, 
Our tangible assets is the far left-hand column. There's two categories of assets. This is under standard number 144, accounting for the impairment or disposal of long-life assets. By the way, standard number 144, as we currently speak, there is an exposure draft because they're going to be changing the criteria for a discontinued operation, so that might affect the criteria for determining whether an item is held for sale under a discontinued operation. I'd already mentioned this to you under Module 7D. That's why you always pay attention to us and to our website. If something changes, we will let you know and we'll be doing an update. We always do updates, okay? But that's for, you know, later on in 2009. Okay, so under standard number 144, the two categories are held for use and held for sale. Okay, held for use means you're going to continue to use it. Held for sale means you're trying to sell it right away and get rid of it. So let's take a look at the column that says held for use. Under held for use, you'll continue to depreciate this asset, and every accounting period you'll test it for impairment. What are the impairment? You have to conduct an impairment test. The impairment test is to compare the carrying value of the asset versus the non-discounted future cash flows. The non-discounted future cash flows are all the cash flows that this asset is going to generate. You have to count them all up. You do not take the time value of money. You add them all up together and you compare that with a carrying value. If the carrying value, which is the historical cost minus the accumulated depreciation, gives you your carrying value. Sometimes on the exam they say the book value. I prefer carrying value. If the carrying value or book value is greater than all the cash that this thing is going to generate in the future, the carrying value is greater than that, then we say that you cannot even cover, the cash does not even cover the book value, so the item is impaired. Then you measure the amount of the impairment loss. The amount of the impairment loss is a carrying value versus a fair market value. And what's new about this handout is I redid this handout for standard number 157. What's new about this handout is the way you measure fair market value, okay? So the carrying value versus a fair market value. So compare the carrying value versus a fair market value. The carrying value is here, the fair market value is here. Then the difference between the carrying value and the fair market value, however you measure it, is the amount of the impairment loss. You will drop down to the bottom block. You may continue to depreciate it, but your depreciation will be less, and you cannot write it up again if it recovers. Now, what's going to happen is the amount of the impairment loss, which is the difference between the carrying value and the fair market value, however you measure the fair market value, all right, is going to be the impairment loss, and the journal entry would be to debit the impairment loss and credit the accumulated depreciation. So the journal entry that you would make for the impairment, and I want this part right here. The journal entry that you would make is that you would debit the impairment loss, credit the accumulated depreciation, okay? By crediting the accumulated depreciation, you increase the accumulated depreciation and you decrease the carry, because you're subtracting a larger number, the carrying value is going to go down, which is what you're trying to do, is you're trying to write down the assets. So once again, the journal entry would be debit impairment loss, Credit accumulated depreciation. The accumulated depreciation, because you credit it, goes up. The carrying value goes down. So what you're doing is you're writing down the asset. Now, where does the impairment loss get reported? The impairment loss gets reported where? Well, the answer is it depends. If you're a publicly traded company, the impairment loss is shown, as I showed you on page 128, and page 128 had your multiple step income statement. If you're a publicly traded company, impairment losses have to be shown where the selling GNA R&D organizational costs get shown. I said minus the impairment loss if you're a SEC registrant, you're publicly traded. If you're not publicly traded, the impairment loss can be shown in minus other expenses and losses. Okay, now let's take a look at held for sale. And, and then we'll do some multiple choice, okay? Let's take a look at held for sale. Now, under held for sale, you're going to write down an asset as a loss. Why? Well, okay, first of all, it's losing money. You're never, ever going to um, uh, sell something that's making you money, okay? It's a dog. That's why you're selling it, folks, okay? <laughs> so you're going to write it down as a loss. How do you measure the amount of the impairment loss? You measure the amount of the impairment loss by comparing the carrying value, remember the carrying value is the historical cost minus accumulated depreciation to give you the carrying value, minus the net realizable value. And the net realizable value is calculated as the fair market value minus the cost of sale. So compare the carrying value versus the um, net realizable value, which is the fair market value minus the cost of sale. Remember, I'm looking back at my handout on page 7, I'm looking under held for sale. Where does this loss go? Once again, the journal entry would still be the same, debit impairment loss, credit the accumulated depreciation. Where does this loss go? Well, if you happen to meet all eight criteria for a discontinued operation, which I discussed in Module 7D, let me just remind you on what page of Module 7D it was. 
And I turned right to it. On page 130, in the middle of page 130, it says A, B, C, D, E, F. And then I told you, oh, G and H, the two criteria right below it. If you meet eight of those eight, all eight of those eight criteria, then what happens, you're considered to be a discontinued operation, okay? But remember, that's going to be changing in 2009. Rely on us. We will tell you when it changes and how it changes, okay? So, if it's held for sale, that loss will go into D of IDE. Remember, D stands for discontinued operations, all right? I stands for income for continued operations. E stands for extraordinary gains and losses. The loss will go into D of IDE if it's a material discontinued item and it met all eight of those uh, criteria for discontinued operation. If it doesn't meet all eight of the criteria, then it's not discontinued then it will just go into the I portion, and the I is income from continued operations. You'll show it as a minus other expenses and losses. I for IDE for immaterial items. You do not depreciate the item. The reason you don't depreciate it is because you're trying to sell it, you're trying to get rid of it, you're not using it. However, you are allowed to write it up again if it recovers. You are allowed to write it up again if it recovers. Let's see if we could do some multiple choice questions on this. Let's take a look at some multiple choice questions. Let's take a look at multiple choice question number 38, please. Number 38. Number 38 is found on page 246. Number 38 on page 246 says, on the December 31st, 2008 balance sheet of West Inc., this equipment and machinery should be reported at what? During 2008, the management of the West Company decided to dispose of its older equipment and machinery. By year end, December 31st, 2008, these assets had not been sold, although the company was negotiating their sale to another company. On December 31st, 2008, balance sheet of West Company, the equipment and machinery should be reported at. Okay, what is this? This is held for use or is held for sale? We're trying to find a buyer, right? This is held for sale, isn't that right? Is it a discontinued operation? No. It's not a discontinued operation because they are not saying anything about the eight criteria for discontinued operation. So it's going to be... Then we're going to measure the amount of the impairment loss between the carrying value and the net realizable value. And the net realizable value is the fair market value minus the cost to sell. So it's the lower of the carrying amount or the fair market value less the cost to sell. So on the December 31st, 2008 balance sheet of West Company, the equipment and machinery should be reported at. The answer would be answer D like David, the lower of the carrying value or the fair market value less the cost to sell. The answer is letter D. Where would this loss go when you write it down from the carrying value down to the fair market value less cost to sell, which is a net realizable value? That impairment loss where you would debit the impairment loss and credit the accumulated depreciation, that impairment loss would go as part of I, income from continuing operations. We cannot put it in D, discontinued operations, because they don't say anything here about discontinued operations or meeting any of the eight criteria for a discontinued operation. So that's where you put on your balance sheet at the lower of the carrying value or net realizable value, which is a fair market value minus the cost to sell. So the best answer for 38 is D, like David. Okay, I'm going to stop here, and on the next diskette, I'm going to like continue on, and I'm going to do some questions that are held for use. Okay? I'll see you in the next disc.